we're working in the area of biorefining and really that 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 sustainable economy spaces. Um, what we've worked on over the last 20 years is developing a technology that can convert oils and fats uh, directly to hydrocarbon fuels. So in the first generation of biofuels, a lot of people were looking at ethanol through fermentation or you know, uh, added, making methyl esters from, from fatty acid resources to make biodiesel. Whereas what we looked at is, is basically using approaches and technologies uh, much more similar to the oil sand sector in Alberta that use high temperature free radical chemistry to directly convert oils and fats into hydrocarbon fuels, which are drop in for both gasoline and diesel fuel. The first generation fuels had conflict around food versus fuel and, and using food grade materials. The existing pathway was transesterification, which makes it compatible with the hydrocarbon world, um, but it's not exactly a hydrocarbon uh, itself. It still has some oxygen in it and it has some polarity. Um, so it, it, it blended well enough and it works well, but there were some issues over time with CloudPoint and, and some other technologies. The second generations moved into more lignocellulosic, which is really the trees and the, the non-food based uh, crop agricultural resources. It was really when the, the hydrocarbon oil industry got involved. They looked at the use of hydrogen and catalysts to really knock out that oxygen and convert the fats and oils directly into the hydrocarbons that they prefer to have. And, and that was a step change because it started creating drop-in fuels that go right into the resource. It, it's actually a better, cleaner burning fuel than the petroleum base that, that it's blending into. So for the first time, they're making a renewable that actually has, on almost every front, better physical and combustion properties. Um, the problem with that scale is you needed really clean resources because of the catalysts and the hydrogen they were using. And then it also requires economies of scale to make that work cost effectively. Well, what we then developed was the high temperature pyrolytic systems that allowed us to convert oils and fats to the same fuels, but the feedstocks we use don't have to be very clean. And in fact, we can use things like brown grease, bent restaurant grease, unrefined tallow, off-grade canola still works really well, but we could use the cheaper resources that were a little bit dirtier. And at the end of the day, because we didn't have the hydrogen generation, we, we were basically able to go uh, capital light, if that makes any sense. So you're getting the same product for a cheaper pathway. And then since then, we've been working on expanding past naphtha and distillate or gasoline diesel equivalents into actually aviation fuels and sustainable aviation biojet uh, and have developed pathways to that as well. Without gas chromatography, we don't do anything. <laughs> I'll be very blunt. I mean, from the very beginning of the basic discovery science 20 years ago, right through to last week, uh, everything we do, we monitor through gas chromatography. So, you know, whether it's online or sample taking, uh, whether it's looking at the gas phase or the liquid phase, gas chromatography is really important to characterize and, and monitor what's happening within the reactor. And really within the gas chromatography world, there's two things we do. We're, we're looking at the composition. So we're trying to quantitate how much of everything's there. And then in many cases, we're, we're coupling that with technologies and detectors like mass spec, where we're gonna look at what is being formed. Um, if, if it's a new compound and we're not familiar with it, we need both the analytical that we get from the flame ionization detectors, as well as the, the, the structural information we get from mass spec. With the new equipment, we're actually able to get resolution of a single injection without derivatization and be able to do the full uh, gambit and portfolio of everything that we're producing in these reactors. So it's an exciting time. And, you know, gas chromatography has been around for decades and it, and it seems like an old technology, but there's a lot of happening at the forefront in terms of being able to separate and the resolution and especially the time around uh, these separations. Everything is quicker on the front end, back end, the, the oven temperatures ramp much tighter, which gives us much better information. When you're monitoring continuous systems, you need the data quickly. You need it live time so that we can steer what's happening in the reactor if that makes any sense. You know, there's a lot of the, the, the resource out there that we talk about that's not food grade lipids. Really what we expect over time is to see disruptions where we see um, what we call oleaginous, which is the, the fermentation of single cells that make fats and oils as part of their, their body composition. Um, and when people talk about algae would be one of those classes that we're looking at growing algae either on sunlight or on other carbon resources um, and, and generating these lipids, which could be a large scale, really, you know, going from what we're doing now, which is take advantage of the resource available, uh, trying to stay on the boundary of the food versus fuel debate in a sustainable way, 
But if we unlock some of the other pathways to make lipids at very large scales, then all of a sudden you're, you're talking very, very large billions of gallon scales uh, to become available over the next few decades.